What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. I'm your host, Josh. I'm joined in the studio by my co-host, Austin. Hey, what's up, man? Not too bad, man. How you feeling? I'm good. I'm a little under the weather, but hanging in there. So yeah, bear bear with us. Austin went down hard after we recorded last week's episode and was out pretty much all week. Yeah, I'm trying to get over. Uh, Luckily, every time I've been sick this year, it's not really landed on recording day. So no, it hasn't. I've, I've never been like totally destroyed. So I'm about I'm about eighty percent. All right, that's good. Good to know. Good to know. And then we got the producer Daniel. What's up, man? What's up, man? Today we got a probably one of the craziest stories we've ever covered here on Lights Out, honestly. And it's one that I feel like a lot of people have likely never heard of before. Yeah, this guy's story is, I mean, I don't want to sound too ridiculous, but it's crazy. This guy's story is crazy. The amount of people that he comes across in his short life is crazy. The things that he was doing is crazy. And it, I feel like he's just not gotten enough attention over the years no no i feel like he's kind of gotten lost to history a little bit so this man is named jack parsons and to summarize him in a nutshell he's a sex magic obsessed rocket engineering occultist and like austin was just saying the people that he crosses paths with include the likes of alistair crowley l ron hubbard founder of scientology howard hughes and the list goes on Right before we started recording this episode, Austin and I were talking, we're like, his story would honestly make for a great either movie or like even better, an HBO Max series. I would love to see HBO pick up a mini series of this. Just give it, I don't know, you could do it in like five, six episodes, I think. Yeah. Get just a really solid story, maybe hour long episode. But it needs to be uncensored. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because CBS did a show, which who watches CBS shows? Yeah. Called Nobody. Strange Angel and nobody cared yeah because it was some watered down like you need you need to go completely raw and uncensored for this one because it's that fucking crazy it really is so without further ado we're gonna go ahead and dive into things today because there is a lot of space to cover here jack parsons had the personality of a beatnik which explain that to people that don't know what a beatnik is because beatniks are are were before hippies came along. Beatniks was it was kind of just a different generation, um, similar in mindset, being a free spirit, uh, but just different by generation. They say the author Ken Casey, who wrote "One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest," was oh, was a okay. big. He was kind of the bridge between beatnik to hippie, um, but it's really just between a decade. Almost the same thing, but not exactly. Because it's kind of entering this era of like self-expression and kind of breaking out of the mold, so to speak. Yeah. Because everybody in the 50s and 40s and stuff really kind of all looked the same, acted the same. And yeah. so this is kind of breaking out of that and heading into that sort of new age movement. But Jack was a deeply motivated man. And throughout his short life, he studied rocket science. He dove into the occult and explored the fabric of space, time, and human consciousness. He's also known for throwing crazy sex magic parties, binge reading Aleister Crowley, and playing with toy boats in the bathtub for hours. So with that being said, who really was Jack Parsons? So Jack Parsons was born Marvel Whiteside Parsons on October 2nd, 1914 at the Good Samaritan Hospital in downtown Los Angeles. Years later, he would joke that he was born on the same day as the Antichrist. And over the next several years, that's how some people would come to see him. When Marvel was born, Los Angeles was booming. Hollywood movie studios were planting their roots. And as the first world war raged on, the world began to see the rise of machines. Only a decade before Marvel was born, the Wright brothers had successfully made the first successful flight. But even then, rocketry and reaching the moon was still seen as science fiction or just plain out magic. Luckily, he was born in an era of the U.S. when almost anything was possible. It also helped that he was born to wealthy parents, Ruth Virginia Whiteside and Marvel H. Parsons. And they had just moved across the United States from New England to Los Angeles. And they bought a house on Scarf Street in downtown. But shortly after Marvel Jr. was born, the couple's marriage fell apart. Ruth discovered that Marvel Sr. had been constantly visiting prostitutes behind her back. 
so she filed for a divorce in March of 1915. And after rumors of Marvel's adultery spread through the community, he fled back to Massachusetts. He later joined the military and reached the rank of major. He also remarried another woman and had another son named Charles. Marvel Jr. rarely saw his father again and would only meet his half-brother once in his life. As for Ruth, she kept her ex-husband's last name, but she struggled with the fact that her son shared his first name, so she began calling him John when he was around two or three years old. But as he grew older, his nickname became Jack among friends and family, and that name stuck. After the divorce of his parents, his maternal grandparents moved to California to be closer to Ruth and Jack. They were also wealthy, and they bought a mansion on Orange Grove Boulevard in Pasadena known as the Millionaire's Mile. Ruth and Jack soon moved in with them, and for most of his upbringing, he lived in luxury, surrounded by domestic servants. And he spent so much time around them, he even picked up a slight English accent. Outside of the house, Jack didn't have many friends, and he spent most of his time reading. He loved stories and mythology, the legends of King Arthur, and the folk tales in the Middle Eastern collection titled One Thousand and One Nights. And eventually, he stumbled upon science fiction. At the time, it was called scientific romance or weird fiction, but he really fell in love with the books Jules Verne, which honestly, I'm with that. I loved those books, Journey to the Center of the Earth and Classics, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Like, yeah. Love those books growing up. Yeah, it's hard not to like them. He even searched for local science fiction clubs around Los Angeles and he began reading sci-fi pulp fiction magazines, which was where he really first learned about space travel and rocketry. At the time, rocketry was only fiction. Men only reached the moon in silly children's books, but Jack was determined to make it real. By the age of 12, he attended Washington Junior High School and he had big dreams of becoming a rocket scientist. But he did pretty bad in school. According to some, he had undiagnosed dyslexia for most of his education, and he was also bullied at school because he was effeminate, and they blamed it on his lack of a father figure. Even though he did poorly in school and wasn't popular, he still managed to make a best friend for the rest of his life, and that boy was named Edward Foreman. Unlike Jack, Edward was raised in a poor working class family, and they had bonded over their love for science fiction, which they were both bullied for. Edward was tougher than Jack, so he defended them from the bullies. Together, they adopted the old Latin motto, Ad Astra Per Aspera, which roughly translates to through hardship to the stars. And from then on, they poured their hard work into learning everything there is to know about rocketry. And they loved it so much that they began making homemade gunpowder-based rocket experiments. Sounds like safe, safe experiments to me. And then they would head to places like Arroyo Seco Canyon and set off their homemade explosives. Sometimes they would even do it in his grandparents' back garden and blew holes in the soil from all their failed attempts. A lot of Jack and Edward's rockets never left the ground, but a failure meant that they could watch things explode, which was still a win for them. With each new experiment, Jack tested out new materials and strategies, he used things like aluminum casings and a brand new invention at the time, masking tape. And some of his strategies were a bit outside the scientific norm. Supposedly, it was around this time that Jack started his long journey into the occult. Which, I want to remind people, the occult just means hidden knowledge, mystery, you know, stuff that is outside the realms of what we see as normal science, right? It's kind of the unexplained. Yeah, it's really but, what the occult is. Glad you brought that up because it does have kind of a stigma to it. A lot of people of, just think it means evil. Right. Like it's yeah. all evil, but that's not necessarily true. Right. There was one night that Jack decided, you know, what, I'm going to try to invoke the devil in my bedroom. And apparently that didn't go so well. And he later recalled it as a magical fiasco. After that night, he worried that his invocation might have been successful and he decided to pull away from occult rituals for a while. In 1929, he started classes at John Muir High School, and here he practiced fencing and archery, hobbies he kept for the rest of his life. But his grades still never got any better. So his mother decided to send him away to military boarding school called Brown Military Academy for boys, which was down in San Diego. And not long after, he was supposedly expelled from the school, forget this, blowing up the toilets which 
I mean, that says a lot about Jack, right? Yeah. He's he's a funny guy. Yeah, and I don't know. He's maybe rebellious. He's it's probably into pissed his that teen he's years. There. Yeah, he's like, why'd they send me here? Send me back to the huge mansion that you know, yeah. my grandparents own, where I'm waited on all day. So that's exactly what happened. They sent him back to his grandparents' house. And then in the summer of 1929, Jack and his family took a tour through Europe. And by the time they got home, the Great Depression was right around the corner and his grandparents' wealth began drying up. His grandfather, Walter, passed away the next summer and for the rest of high school, the family still had enough money to send Jack to a privately run university school. And Jack flourished there. He even became the editor of the school newspaper and he went on to win an award for literary excellence. And many of the teachers there noticed his interesting chemistry skills. But as he did better in school, his family's financial problems worsened. Jack had to start working after school at the Hercules Powder Company, which was a chemical ammunition manufacturing company. His coworkers noticed that even though Jack had come from you know wealthy upbringing, that he still treated his fellow blue collar workers with respect and he quickly became well-liked at the factory. The environment was also perfect for Jack because he got to learn more about explosives and use them in his rocket propulsion. Meanwhile, he and Edward continued to blow shit up in their free time, and they would build all sorts of different types of rockets, and much of the material they used, Jack had actually stolen from work. He soon got serious and constructed his own solid rocket-fueled engine with a few other friends. This was the time when he really started to dig into his studies and the sad part of that is right when he became interested and started excelling and you know he was getting good grades and education he saw as his future uh he just the money started to dry up and then his kind of privilege faded away but he found ways around that he would spend hours at a time talking on the phone um with his peers but also more well-established rocket scientists of the time he made a name for himself, and he even spoke with a man named Werner von Braun uh, from Germany. Werner was a big rocket scientist, and he would unfortunately later become a member of the Nazi party. Uh, but he was developing rocket technology for Nazi Germany. And if you know anything about that time, V2 rockets, everything like that was kind of that could tilt the war one way or another come World War II. Now, we're not at World War II yet in the story, but these guys are kind of seeing the future here a little bit. He was eventually captured by Soviets, sent to the U.S. Yeah, that's what's wild. Yeah, isn't that crazy? He ends up coming here. They're like, yeah, you were a Nazi, but we need your brain because clearly you know a lot about rocket science. So Werner von Braun would then go on to pioneer rocket and space technology for NASA, the Apollo programs in the 1960s. But both Werner and Jack saw at the time that the 30s, you know, it was still seen as a joke. It was still seen as sci-fi, but they saw something a little more real in it. And they also saw it as a little bit of sacred knowledge that was somehow connected to the occult. It wasn't just this thing that you studied. It was kind of this, you embody the lifestyle of it. It's this spiritual thing. And we all know that Nazis in the SS, uh, we've talked about this before, that they were known for their obsession with the occult, right? And also during these phone calls and conversations that they would have, Jack would later realize that German rocketry was way beyond U.S. rocketry in the 1930s. And as World War II was approaching, Jack could see the writing on the walls, and he knew that in wartime, the U.S. military would need rocketry and he knew that the government was going to start dumping money into it so early on he saw the writing on the wall and said hey i'll i'll dig my heels into rocketry because this is going to be a lucrative field coming up yeah it's really interesting to really wrap your head around because i don't think a lot of people realize that's like where it started yeah it was really with jack parsons and he knew that this was going to, I feel like he knew from the very beginning that this was going to be something big one day. And, and like you said, I think exploration of space in a lot of, a lot of ways ties into spirituality, right? Like the, the idea of the universe and, and consciousness and everything like that and life elsewhere in the universe. And yeah, so it makes sense that he would be, interested in that especially since he was already kind of diving into those more taboo subjects at the time because obviously 
when you you know dive into science fiction and stuff you obviously start talking about aliens and things like that and you know what what life looks like outside of of earth so i just find that very interesting that yeah this was so early on in in our history and he was kind of way ahead of the time but it, i mean he was also so interested in sci-fi and even though it was seen as this little kids thing but any good sci-fi writer it's you know you can go back and read brave new world and it's they're kind of seeing the future they're trying to determine where we're going it's kind of a critique on science also social sciences and stuff yeah. it's kind of looking into the future and i think he saw that early on so he was just trying to look into the future a little bit more i mean it's called science fiction for a reason right yeah. science is a part of that so it's yeah. like what does that look like years down the road so jack eventually graduated high school in 1933 and he moved to a smaller house on saint john avenue with his mother and grandmother he loved science and rocketry but he never lost his love for literature and so he continued to write. He soon enrolled in Pasadena Junior College with hopes of getting an associate's degree in physics and chemistry, but he ended up dropping out of school after only one semester, and his family's finances only worsened from the Great Depression. And instead of college, he had to take up a full-time employment at the Hercules Power Plant, and they paid him a monthly wage of $100, which in today's money, that'd be about 2,000 bucks. But after his work in the plants, he was plagued by severe headaches from the exposure to nitroglycerin. After saving enough money from work, he returned to school and started his degree in chemistry at Stanford University. But again, he learned it was far too expensive to see that through. So he returned to Pasadena. Despite the terrible economy, he still continued his education. He and his friend Edward attended lectures by famous rocket engineers. They weren't doing it for college credits though, they just did it for the pure love of rocketry. They eventually came across a PhD student, Frank Molina, and they became lifelong friends and colleagues. Jack was the chemist, Edward was the machinist, and Frank was the technical theoretician. Together with the help of a few more researchers and advisors, Jack was allowed to operate at the Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology, also known as GALSIT. The lab had been abandoned during the Great Depression, and after opening it up again, the group named itself Galsit Rocket Research Group. And through this, Jack was able to use their specialized equipment. But his new friend Frank soon realized that Jack was a bit out there. He later wrote, quote, Jack lacked the discipline of a formal higher education, but had an uninhibited and fruitful imagination. Rocketry to the moon was still seen as sci-fi, and even though there are more planes and blimps in the air than ever before, Rockets to the moon were still just a joke, but that only inspired Jack even more. When they weren't discussing missions to the moon, the group would smoke weed and drink beer in their free time. Jack and Frank also worked on sci-fi screenplay they planned on pitching to Hollywood eventually. The characters were all heavily inspired by members of the Rocket group, and the story had strong themes of anti-capitalism and pacifism. These opinions would eventually put Jack on the FBI's radar. Meanwhile, Jack had met a professor named Theodore von Karman, who quickly became like a father figure to him because he had been searching for one for quite a while. Theodore was a mathematician, aerospace engineer, and physicist. He was also Frank's doctoral advisor at the time. And when he first met Jack, he really liked how open he was about far out ideas and this obsession with space. He also noticed that Jack was way more relaxed than some of the other uptight students and faculty at Caltech as they called it, which is the California Institute of Technology. But at some point, Theodore discovered Jack's interest in the occult and the paranormal. And he even, I'm not sure exactly what the conversation was, but he told Jack that he was a direct descendant of a 16th century rabbi. And that rabbi's name was Judah Leben Betzalel. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And Judah is known for creating the Golem of Prague. Now, if you don't know what the Golem of Prague is, uh, in Jewish folklore, this was an 11 foot tall golem that he made out of clay from the banks of the Voltava River. And he brought it to life through rituals and Hebrew incantations. Golems are essentially animated creatures that are made of inanimate matter. They have no conscience and they act similar to robots. So we're not talking about Smeagol? <laughs> we're not talking about Golem Smeagol, no. 
if anything, most of us could relate to. If anybody out there has played Minecraft, there's some golems out there. There's just the massive things walking around that look kind of stupid, but they can smash some skulls if they need to. Uh, this concept of a golem even went on to inspire Mary Shelley's monster in Frankenstein. They were first mentioned in the Bible and some say the mythology can actually be traced back to Mayan myths of gods creating beings made out of wood or the ancient Greeks creating living statues. But golems as we know them today came from Jewish folklore. They typically have thick limbs, small heads with human-like features, and they can also grow bigger over time. It's believed once they get too big, they might rebel against their creator. A lot of people have drawn parallels between golems, and some say it's maybe it's more of a an allegory for humans. Mm. Um, and we know biblically, like there are stories where Adam's made out of clay. God makes Adam, and then once Adam, you know, oh, quote, okay. grows grows big enough, he then kind of rebels against his creator. He eats the fruit. So it kind of stems from this biblical mythology. Um, in as far as the Golem of Prague goes, he was created to protect the Prague ghettos from anti-Semitic attacks or pogroms, which were violent riots that massacred ethnic or religious groups, especially Jewish people. In some versions of this story, this Golem gets too big, it gets out of control, and starts going on a murderous rampage. So the rabbi is able to stop this Golem from its murderous rampage by pulling a shem from his mouth, which is essentially just, he's using a magic word to somehow stop this golem. And then the golem falls to pieces. The rabbi then stored the remains in the old new synagogue where his plan was it can be restored to life if they need it to protect the synagogue or the Jewish people again. Legend has it that the golem's body is still somewhere in the attic up there. But when it was renovated back in 1883, there was no evidence of the golem at all. Some believe it was stolen. Maybe it was entombed in a nearby graveyard. They're not sure. But in a more recent legend, uh, they say that a Nazi agent at some point snuck into the synagogue's attic when the Nazis were destroying synagogues ac across former Czechoslovakia. And then that Nazi died under suspicious circumstances. Some say he was found torn to pieces. And the synagogue was protected for the rest of the war. It still stands today. There's much more lore to the Golem of Prague. We could probably do an entire episode on wow. it. There's, there's a lot here. But to tie this all back, you're probably asking, Austin, why are you on your yeah. BS about this Golem of Prague? It has nothing what to do with it. What happened to Jack? Yeah, what happened to Jack? Well, I'm going to tie this tangent back around to Jack Parsons. I think when they discussed this, there was something about this story that Jack clung on to. And he was now convinced that he had some distant connection to Jewish folklore, something mythological. But also in the story of the Golem, it's it's about creating something supernatural or, or that someone once thought was supernatural, but then it, it's manifested in reality. And so maybe he that inspired him. They're like, look at the science fiction. People think this is silly. People think this is something supernatural reaching the moon. It's It's crazy. And it's only something you find in books but maybe Jack saw it. this is his golem that he thinks that he can manifest and bring to life. So boom, wrap there it you back go. in. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So meanwhile, around this time, Jack met a lady named Helen Northup at a local church dance. After dating for a while, Jack proposed and Helen accepted. Supposedly, Jack was an avid uh, hunter and gun enthusiast at the time, and he actually gave Helen a pistol as an engagement present. By April 1935, they got married at the Little Church of the Flowers in Glendale. They moved into a house on South Terrace Drive, Pasadena. Alongside his work in rocketry, he got a job at an explosives manufacturer called the Halifax Powder Company. And it wasn't long before Helen noticed Jack was dumping their money into the Galsit Rocket Research Group. And Jack even began manufacturing nitroglycerin in their home and asked Helen's family for loans. He even pawned her engagement ring for extra cash, and he needed to keep his rocket projects going at all cost. And only a couple years later, the rocket research group had finally grown. They soon became so popular that their donations could sustain their research, but the new attention also got them a reputation. 
They became known on campus as the Suicide Squad from their lethal explosions. The local press also caught on to how dangerous some of their experiments were. Jack soon became a local star when he testified as an explosives expert in a high-profile attempted murder case. Head of police intelligence in LA, Captain Earl Kinnett, was on trial for conspiring to murder private investigator Harry Raymond. Harry was a former LAPD detective fired after whistleblowing against police corruption. This string of corruption led all the way up to the mayor's office, so it was believed that Earl had tried to kill Harry with a car bomb. During the trial, Jack included his forensic reconstruction of the car bomb and its explosion. He even created a replica of the bomb, which he used to blow up a car in the desert as a demonstration and his testimony later got most of the credit for the conviction. The case ended up costing the city thousands of dollars along with a bad reputation. And the result of this case ended up cracking open far more corruption cases for the city of Los Angeles and of course the LAPD. Earl was sentenced to serve two years to life in prison and the police chief was forced into retirement. Now that 23-year-old Jack was in the local spotlight, liked by academics and seen as an expert by the public, he was ready to move his career forward in rocketry. He also had charisma and charm, which would eventually help make him famous across the country and eventually the world. Behind the scenes, Jack subscribed to the People's Daily World, a Marxist news publication. He also joined the ACLU, which had a harsh stigma at the time, but he refused to officially join the American Communist Party, which caused a rift in the rocket research group. By late 1938, only the three founding members remained, Jack, Edward, and Frank. As the new year came around, Jack and his wife Helen had become close friends with brother and sister John and Francis Baxter. In January of 1939, they convinced the Parsons to go with them to the Church of Thelema on Winona Boulevard in Hollywood. I'll try to give you a, a breakdown. I was going to say, this is a huge topic, which I do want to do a whole episode diving into Thelema. Yeah, we could. Yeah, um, it's There's a lot to unpack here. So... Thelema, Thelema, it's been pronounced a few different ways. I think going forward, we'll just pronounce it Thelema. Thelema. Um, but it was founded by the famous occultist Aleister Crowley in the early 1900s. We have an, an old episode about yeah. Aleister Crowley. Yeah. He's a very interesting character. Um, it's very hard to break down this belief system. It's a mixture of occult, social, and spiritual philosophy. The central idea, though, to remember is to follow one's true will and that's also why it adds to the difficulty of breaking it down since it's so individual yeah it's, it can be interpreted a lot of different ways exactly but their motto was inspired by the old hellfire club uh do what thou wilt if you remember that one and since the lemma focused mostly on the individual yeah people have like you said many different interpretations it was all about being yourself following your own true path which was a very popular idea at the time in newer religious beliefs. But its central text was the Book of the Law, written by Aleister Crowley himself. I haven't read it. I don't know. Have you read it? I, I tried to start reading it, and it's a, it's a tough read. Yeah, the wording is quite... He, he makes it sound very old style. Yeah, you have to really digest like each page, because it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a lot to wrap your head around. Yeah. I know it draws from uh, Buddhism some old Judaism, some Christianity. It also dives into occult philosophy, which really sets it apart from the other established organized religions. Two of the central concepts are, quote, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, and, quote, love is the law, love under will. And by that second quote, while well, you're probably wondering, yes, the book of the law did have a lot of sexual undertones and just blatant overtones as well. Here's a few quotes just to give you a good idea. The word of sin is restriction. O oh man, refuse not thy wife, if she will. O oh lover, if thou wilt, depart. There is no bond that can unite the divided but love. All else is a curse. Accursed. Accursed be to the eons. Hell. Here's another one. Then saith the prophet and slave of the beauteous one, Who am I? And what shall be the sign? So she answered him, bending down, a lambent flame of blue, all touching, all penetrant, her lovely hands upon the black earth, and her lithe body arched for love, and her soft feet not hurting the little flowers. Thou knowest. 
and the sun shall be my ecstasy, the consciousness of the continuity of existence, the omnipresence of my body. Whew. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So you're definitely getting the sexual overtones there. Uh, but yeah, so essentially they believed in sex magic, which is the power of sex and orgasms, the act itself, and what comes of it. And they believed that while performing these sexual acts, you could also simultaneously, you're performing these rituals, spells, people are scrying, people, you know, they, they thought that this was the way to access the other side, something spiritual. It is an interesting concept to to consider, though, because when you experience that, there's that small window, right? And so in that window of time, however long the orgasm lasts, they believe... Seven minutes for me. (laughs) Damn, dude. That's impressive. But in my short window of time, (laughs) my five seconds, there it opens that window to, they believe, some other... You know, you're able to connect with the universe or whatever the universal power is or love and it's kind of this connection with the divine right and so they would do that's why they would do the sex magic to in you know invoke those orgasms to in which they would then do spells and whatnot to make things happen or will things into existence and and yeah so and i mean it might seem perverted from the outside but i i think there's maybe something to it i mean let i'll tie in the golem of Prague again, if you think about this construction of life, the orgasm, right, at least for a man, and the act of sex is about reproducing, right? Especially for a lot of religions, that's like the core, being raised Catholic, you don't have sex unless you're procreating, right? right? So that idea of like creating life, that does seem almost supernatural, that does seem divine, that you are now a creator of life. So I think if you tap into it, maybe on a, a different plane there, because I, I maybe from the outside it looks a bit silly that these people are just trying to have sex and do weird things, but I don't know, there might be something to it, you know. I agree, and of course, as long as it's consensual, right? Because there is a lot of, I mean, and there's a lot of things put out there about Aleister Crowley specifically being you know, maybe everything wasn't consensual, maybe it was abusive, maybe there was, you know, minors involved. There's a lot of things that that go around out there around him. So by no means am I saying is his take on on this good or bad necessarily. I do find it very curious though. Like there's something about it that I think is inherently deep. And I think just the whole idea of sex kind of opening this gateway to to the divine or this other realm of existence is very interesting especially if you believe in in the power of love and and sort of the you know love binds binds everything together it's the most powerful emotion we experience as human beings i believe yeah and so when you think about it it's like what is love in physical form it's that intimate intimacy right right and so when you ultimately are intimate with somebody and you know you you achieve that climax i feel like there is something very powerful that's happening there and there's obviously something going on in the brain there's a release of endorphins and and chemicals and it's kind of like that moment of like true connection so when you dig deep into it it makes a lot of sense that somebody like alistair crowley and and the lima would would focus on that and hone in on that. Maybe there is something more to that, which is, which is really interesting to me. Yeah. But after Jack went to Gnostic mass for the first time, he became very, very intrigued with the Lima and Alistair Crowley, its leader. The Gnostic mass is similar to the Catholic Latin mass in a lot of ways. They even performed communion and consumed the Eucharist. But during the Gnostic mass, they mentioned several other pagan gods, goddesses, as well as prayers to the sun, chaos, air, and Baphomet. Jack eventually dove into a few other Aleister Crowley books. By this time, Aleister had already become known as the greatest occultist on the earth, also nicknamed the Great Beast 666, which that name, of course, scares a lot of people. And again, just are like, oh, he's this evil, evil man. He literally calls himself the Great Beast 666. But it's 
if you look into it more, it's because he knew exactly what that name would, you know, that notoriety would bring him. Yeah, he was a provocateur, you know. Exactly. Yeah. He's just, he knows it's going to get a rise out of people. That's why he did it. But participating in this religious movement was seen by the public as an act of heresy. Still, Jack and Helen were impressed, and they even began discussing opening their marriage so they could experience sex magic with other members. After converting to Thelema, Jack and his wife also joined the Agape Lodge in February 1941. This was the Californian branch of Thelema called Ordo Templi Orientis, abbreviated as OTO, which was a secret society. Alistair was known to enjoy his secrecy. In the Book of the Law, he wrote, quote, let my servants be few in secret. They shall rule the many and the known. While there, Jack became close friends with a man named Wilfred Talbot Smith, who was the OTO Lodge's leader. He had run the lodge from his mansion on Orange Grove Boulevard. While he spent his time there, Jack began diving deeper into Aleister Crowley's writings. Jack believed that ritual magic could somehow be explained through the scientific field of quantum theory. He also began performing in the Gnostic Mass and also tried to get his friends and colleagues interested and Thelema. But most of them were turned off by the occult. As, as we know, a lot of people are turned off by it because of its connection to, you know, the devil and evil and, you know, the people associated with the occult. The only friends who took an interest were another Caltech student named Grady McMurtry and Helen's sister, Sarah Northrop. Sarah was friendly at first, but would later cause problems in Jack's and Helen's marriage. Just a little side note, in the lodge, uh, Jack took on the translated mantra of, quote, the establishment of the lemma through the rituals of love. And this was originally a Latin motto whose initials spelled out topan, T-O-P-A-N. And this also took on the meaning to pan, which pan or pan was the pagan fertility god. And in the Kabbalistic numerology, topan was the number 210 jack also began signing his name on letters as 210 and that's kind of how he referred to himself to his occult associates jack became so influential in the oto that its leader wilfred wrote letters to alistair crowley saying quote he has an excellent mind and a much better intellect than myself jp is going to be very valuable Wilfred and Jack became so close that the FBI would later suggest that there was a sexual relationship between the two men. Of course they would. The FBI at yeah. the time was, you know, anybody they didn't like, they were trying to make up stuff. Yep. I mean, look what they, they did to Martin Luther King. Yep. Didn't they say it was like, well, they were like, he cheated on his wife and that was the big, they tried to do the smear campaign on him, stuff like that. Yeah, they did similar things to Jack Parsons, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Many believe this was just an attack on Jack Parsons since he had once taken an interest in communism and now occultism, but the FBI's opinion of him didn't matter. Jack's charm and intelligence made him well-liked in the OTO. He also had a great sense of humor. A former silent movie star, Sarah Jane Wolfe, also took a liking to Jack. She had been one of the founders of the Lodge and a personal associate to Aleister Crowley. She even lived with him at one point and took the Oath of the Abyss. By the time Jack had joined the church, Sarah was seen as a respected elder in the community, and she was impressed with his knowledge of art and music. Another associate even called Jack Crowley-esque. Alistair himself ended up agreeing and eventually said that Jack was, quote, the most valued member of the whole order, no exception. Wow, yeah. that's a pretty big uh, compliment. While Jack was rising in the ranks of the lemma, he continued writing and reading science fiction. And he began taking his inspiration from the occult and using it as a lens for science experiments and science fiction itself. One of the books that left a deep impression on Jack was called Darker Than You Think by Jack Williamson. And it's not surprised that Jack loved this book when he read it. It had a bunch of magical ideas like concentration, will, altered states of being. It also mentioned the devil, paganism, and witchcraft. So the book's plot was about these shamanic people who had the ability to shape shift into animals. The tribe was made of survivors who were a race of werewolves at one point. They were once defeated by humans, but managed to survive by disguising themselves as humans. And after Jack read it, he drew a lot of parallels between the book and his own life. And it also reminded him a lot of Aleister Crowley's mythology. And yeah, I wonder why he thinks 
maybe it's the shaman part of it. Maybe he sees himself like that. I also wonder, does he see himself as uh, like a, a werewolf that has been once defeated by humans? Does he, is he starting to see himself as an outcast? There might be a lot to break down there, but that was one of his favorite books at the time. I think he's just a really, really deep guy. I think he's, he's really, I mean, just based on, on the people he's associating with and the people and the books that he's reading, he's very interested in kind of how it all ties together. It's very interesting that his personal life is so connected to what he does for a living too. And, and his, his professional work is, is kind of one in the same because ultimately it's kind of the, just the interest in, in the unknown. And at the time it's space, it's the moon, it's, it's all the astrological bodies, which I think he's clearly interested in astrology, numerology and things like that. So he's interested in all of these sort of occult topics that all kind of tie back to the same thing of like what is this all about who are we and asking these really hard questions and and therefore he's diving into these different books that give different explanations for why things the way the way that they are and so that's kind of the way that i take it i do love that he takes sci-fi books that can just be seen as these weird fantasy sci-fi things but really tries to draw the parallels which i think is the at the core of sci-fi is yeah. what you're supposed to be doing right where a lot of people just look at it as this fun kind of fantasy thing that doesn't really have much to do with our own lives but i like it yeah he seems like a an avid reader and a, a very deliberate reader too yeah well i mean a lot of sci-fi as much as it has you know it's about the futuristic technology and you know things that could exist one day like some i mean some sci-fi is like so so far in it in the future that you're like we'll never get there there's just or it's just according to the laws of physics it's not possible but i i think of of stories like star wars especially and you look at like the way that george lucas made that story there's so much more to it than just the technology and and the the characters and and sort of the storylines and and really it's it comes back to this idea of the force right and it's kind of this i think it's based on a lot of eastern philosophy and, yeah. and religious ideas of like the force is kind of you know there's that you can either be on the dark side or the, or the light side it's kind of that yin and yang sort of of look at uh, energy as a whole um i mean what do, what do you think danny that's you're the your resident star wars <laughs> fan like would you agree with that statement that Star Wars really has this underlying like philosophical sort of look at at life and how you live your life to you know kind of leads you to where you end in the afterlife in a way and and I don't know that's kind of what I took away from Star Wars. I mean I definitely agree with you that Star Wars has a uh a second meaning to it. I mean Lucas uh, George Lucas himself even admitted that Star Wars was an allegory for the Vietnam War, especially around uh, Nixon trying to get reelected. He even mentions that uh, democracies aren't taken, they're given away. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's a lot of meaning in sci-fi in general, not even just Star Wars. I think, I think sci-fi is a great parallel to reality, and it's a way to tell, it, it's a way to comment on our reality and our current you know situation through another lens yeah i think that's the beauty yeah. of uh sci-fi in general it's also why i think the most recent star wars sucked is because they were trying to tell star wars stories and not real, real life stories, stories. Yeah. um no it's it's a great tool for for it's a great reflection tool that we can kind of look back at ourselves yeah. if star wars is about vietnam even dune is about the middle east because arrakis the planet iraq uh, spice is the resource oil is the resource right there's a there's a lot of parallels that you can draw and it's cool that jack parsons is also drawing these parallels to his own life because i yeah at, at the core of it i think that's the whole point you yeah know? yeah alongside jack's interest in books he was still very dedicated to rocketry but now jack and his colleagues referred to it as jet propulsion to try and shake off the stigma attached to rocket science and now the military was interested in jet-assisted takeoffs, or JADO, for airplanes. Jack and his colleagues were then made the first U.S. government-sanctioned rocket research group in June 1939. Unfortunately, they had to move their operations from Caltech. 
and a quarter of their government funding went to repairing damaged Caltech buildings caused by their rocket experiments. They set up their new operations at Jack and Edward's childhood launching grounds, Arroyo Seco. But they didn't mind a return to their roots. Jack and Edward's dreams were finally coming true. From Jack's occultist inspirations, Arroyo Seco wasn't just a launching ground. It would actually become a sacred place for Thelema. The first Jado test took place in late July of 1941, but the units frequently exploded and damaged the aircraft. After several failures and many adjustments, they ran 62 tests, and many of the units still exploded. In early 1942, the U.S. military ordered a flight test using liquid rather than solid fuel. By now, the U.S. had already entered World War II. Many of the men who worked on the project, including Jack, realized that if they failed to provide jet-assisted takeoff technology for the military, they would be drafted into combat. Under pressure, they began having successful launches out in the Mojave Desert by August. Jado now reduced takeoff distance by 30%. Jack's friend Frank Molina wrote to his parents, quote, we now have something that really works, and we should be able to give fascists hell. The group then agreed to produce and sell 60 JATO engines to the U.S. Army Air Corps. Jack was now one step closer to proving to the world they could send rockets into space. He and his team joined the Aerojet Engineering Corporation in March 1942, and they opened their offices on Colorado Boulevard. Jack became the project engineer of the Solid Fuel Department. Even though they provided the military with their rockets, they believed that their end goal was rooted in using rockets for peaceful space exploration. So while Jack was shooting off rockets out in the desert, he was also concerned about possibly more important things, and this was the rocket in his pants. <laughs> because before the hippie era of free love in the 60s, the lemma was kind of treading new ground here. And these occult gatherings had harnessed sexual energy. In their secret occult circle, ritual magic and sex, as we know, went together like peanut butter and jelly. And Aleister Crowley always encouraged sex. But here's the tricky thing. By now, Helen and Jack had an open marriage. And things got weird when in June 1941, Jack began a sexual relationship with Helen's younger sister, Sarah Northrup. She was also only 17 at the time, which is a bit controversial here. And she started declaring herself as Jack's new wife, at least within the context of that organization. But Jack said that their sexual relationship didn't affect his love for his wife, Helen. Unsurprisingly, Helen wasn't exactly happy with this outcome, even though they both agreed to this open marriage and to find new sexual partners and enjoy the sex magic it is a bit weird that it's her younger sister right i guess you got to draw some lines somewhere here so she decides to find another sexual partner of her own and she began having sex with wilfred who was the oto's leader and they eventually grew happy together and both jack and helen kind of just got used to their new arrangement here the two couples along with a few other individuals and families ended up moving out and they moved to 1003 South Orange Grove Boulevard in Pasadena. And it's this beautiful American craftsman style mansion. Each of them paid $100 in rent. And this house became the new headquarters for the OTO Lodge. They ended up growing their own food in the backyard, raising their own livestock. And here's an excerpt from one of Jack's famous poems he wrote during his time at the lodge. I hate Don Quixote. I live on peyote, marijuana, morphine, and cocaine. I never knew sadness, but only a madness that burns at the heart and the brain. Well, maybe it's the peyote, marijuana, morphine, and cocaine, <laughs> yeah, buddy. That might be burning at the Damn, heart and the dude. brain. So a lot of drug use. You don't feel use. anything on all four of those. <laughs> a lot of drug use at this time as well. Oh, yeah. At the lodge, Jack also decided to build his own laboratory here to continue his rocket research. His income from Aerojet mostly went to the organization in Aleister Crowley in England. The company operated on a budget of $650,000 by mid-1943. After the U.S. became aware of German V-2 rocket, the company also was given a grant of $3 million. His old friend and coworker Edward eventually joined Jack in the lodge. Around this time, Jack's colleagues noticed that his passion for rockets and the occult had fused together. 
To Jack, they were basically the same thing. His occult jargon started mixing with his scientific jargon, and this mix of the occult and science annoyed his old friend Frank Molina, and he started causing problems with his work. Jack also started inviting rocket science colleagues to parties at the lodge, and all of them would be hung over the next morning for work. It was an open secret that Jack had also started abusing prescription drugs and hallucinogens. Meanwhile, the neighbors on South Orange Grove Boulevard got more annoyed with Jack and his occultist friends. They even started filing reports with the Pasadena Police Department and even the FBI. The group was accused of being a black magic cult that threw occasional orgies. Neighbors also accused OTO members of raping a 16-year-old boy. And they also claimed that they had witnessed a ritual of a naked pregnant woman jumping through fire. But every time the officers or FBI agents showed up to the house, they couldn't find any signs of illegal activity. So behind closed doors, sex, drugs, and magic rituals continued. After months of organized chaos, Jack eventually impregnated Claire McMurtry, the wife of one of his colleagues, Grady. Jack then paid for her to have an abortion. After this, Grady turned against him after years of friendship. Hmm, I wonder why. Yeah. But Jack was still loved in his little community. By 1942, Alistair Crowley wanted to replace Wilford as head of the OTO Lodge. From across the ocean, Alistair had kept a watchful eye on the place. He believed Jack had a strong grasp on science and magic, and he would be the one to bring his organization into the future. But many didn't want to see Wilfred go. This caused a split inside their community. So Alistair Crowley devised a plan. He created a magical quest that he would send Wilfred on. After Helen gave birth to Wilfred's child, Alistair told Wilfred that he was a reincarnation of a god, which Alistair truly believed. But this meant Wilfred needed a long retreat. For Wilfred, he knew this retreat would mean ending his role as a lodge leader. When the time came, Jack showed his support. They were both still friends and had respect for each other. And many members of the community even called Wilfred the unknown god as a sign of respect. At some point, Alistair wrote a letter to Theodore asking him not to resign. But the letter might have been requested by Jack to make Wilfred think he wasn't being forced out of his position. As the transition of power began, members of the OTO were concerned with Jack's drug taking and womanizing, and many didn't think he was fit to be their leader. Alistair still appointed Jack as the acting head of the lodge, and they renamed the home the Parsonage, which was a play on Jack's last name and a church house for clergy members. Around the same time, Jack's rocket business was growing and his reputation had become a problem. After getting millions of dollars from the US government, many high-ranking officials were disturbed by the fact that occultists like Jack and Edward were developing rockets for them. It was also determined that both Jack and Edward had had affairs with almost an entire secretarial department at Aerojet, and in 1944, both of them were persuaded to sell their stock in the company. Each left the company with $11,000. And with that money, Jack ended up buying the lease to the parsonage. So as the new owner and leader of the lodge, Jack would later give a speech to the community in 1945, trying to bring the ideas of Aleister Crowley into modern life. And here's what he said. The mainspring of an individual is his creative will. This will is the sum of his tendencies, his destiny, his inner truth. It is one with the force that makes the birds sing and flowers bloom. As inevitable as gravity, as implicit as a bowel movement, it informs alike atoms and men and sons. To the man who knows this will, there is no why or why not, no can or cannot. He is. There is no known force that can turn an apple into an alley cat. There is no known force that can turn a man from his will. This is the triumph of genius that, surviving the centuries, enlightens the world. This force burns in every man. Now that Jack and Edward no longer worked in Aerojet, they founded the Ad Astra Engineering Company, a reference to their old childhood motto. Jack also founded the chemical manufacturing company, Vulcan Powder Company, and Ad Astra was soon investigated by the FBI. The company was under suspicion of espionage. Supposedly, security agents from the Manhattan Project found out that Jack and Edward had gotten chemicals used in a top secret project for a material known as X-Metal, or natural uranium. Both Jack and Edward were later acquitted, but this wouldn't be the last time that Jack would be harassed by the FBI. It was around this time that Jack also asked for a divorce from Helen. He was still financially supporting her and Wilfred. He was still good friends with them and even welcomed Wilfred back to the parsonage after his long retreat was over. At the same time, Jack also began renting rooms at the house. 
He plays ads in the paper, inviting bohemians, artists, musicians, atheists, anarchists, and any other exotic types to come and live. The ad also said that any mundane soul will be unceremoniously rejected. Newcomers who responded to the ad immediately noticed that Jack was as strange as they were. He would often answer the door with a pet snake around his neck, and he also set up a mannequin called The Resident, dressed in a tuxedo and holding a bucket they used as a mailbox. Newcomers also noticed that Jack loved spending hours in the bathtub, playing with toy boats. But along with his fun side, he also suffered from what he called manic hysteria and depressing melancholy. Only his closest friends knew that his father, Marvel, was often in and out of psychiatric hospitals treated for clinical depression, and many believed that Jack had inherited this depression. Other times he would get sparks of energy and creativity, but living with Jack was always interesting to say the least. Soon enough, the parsonage had a constant flow of visitors. So, in the end, this was how Jack met the science fiction writer and U.S. Navy officer L. Ron Hubbard. Now, if you don't know who L. Ron Hubbard is, you might be living under a rock, but he would go on to write Dianetics and create the Church of Scientology. At the time, though, he was mostly just a pulp science fiction writer trying to find purpose in the world, which is why he ended up at the Parsonage. In one of his other writings around that time, it was called Affirmations, he wrote that when he got to the OTO Lodge, it was a time in his life when he had encountered various physical, sexual, physiological, and social issues. He struggled with civilian life after returning from the military, and his family life was also falling apart. He also suffered from various health complications, which put him in and out of military hospitals, and he had failed to make it as a writer, and he was living on government disability payments. Despite his bad luck, he believed that he had a guardian angel and her name was Empress. She was a beautiful winged woman with red hair who saved his life many times, and he even believed that this guardian angel led him to Jack's house. While at the parsonage, he hoped to use some sort of self-hypnosis to resolve his psychological problems, and he just really wanted to conjure this positive mental attitude while there. He quickly became friends with Jack, and they thought it was destiny that brought them together. In his free time, Elrond entertained all the guests at the house with his wartime tales and funny stories that he had from the Navy in World War II. And considering that for the past decade or so, the war had made it difficult for people to travel around the world. So that's what made Elrond so interesting to them. He had all these stories from across the world. And soon enough, he also began participating in the sex magic rituals. Jack noticed how willing he was to participate, and he also noticed how Elrond had no interest in politics of the organization at all. All he really cared about was the magic itself. And over time, Jack and Elrond, they even compared their relationship to the legendary occultists who had come before them, like John Dee and Edward Kelly. I, I loved that old episode of ours. Or he even compared them to Aleister Crowley and Victor Newberg. Jack even wrote to Aleister saying, Quote, even though Elrond has no formal training in magic, he has an extraordinary amount of experience and understanding in the field. For some of his experiences, I deduce he is in direct touch with some higher intelligence, possibly his guardian angel. He is the most thelemic person I have ever met and is in complete accord with our own principles. Soon enough, everyone in the OTO had a very high opinion of Elrond, and this included the women there. They were also attracted to him sexually, including Sarah Northrup, who, if you remember, that is now Jack's wife's younger sister. They haven't divorced yet. And she was 17 years old at the time that they started having a relationship. And then this is now Jack's current partner. And now she's interested in L. Ron Hubbard. Since Jack and Sarah were in an open relationship, they were encouraged to participate in polyamorous sexual ethics by the OTO. And Sarah soon became interested in Elron, Even though Jack understood they were in an open relationship and he had had sex with other women, he still got extremely jealous. He tried to keep a positive attitude, but he saw that Sarah was forming a romantic bond with Elron and not just a sexual one. So Jack was motivated to find a new partner. And he thought the best way to do this was through magic. 
Around this time, members of the OTO noticed Jack walking around the house dressed in a black cloak and performing rituals late at night. Some became worried, though, that he was invoking demonic entities, even admitted that he wanted to invoke something no matter what. He just wanted a result. Soon enough, Jack began witnessing paranormal events in the house after his rituals. Some of these included poltergeist activity, floating orbs, ghostly apparitions, changes in the weather, and hearing disembodied voices. Some community members thought that Elrond and Sarah were just pranking him. One night, Edward witnessed screaming banshees that came up to the house's windows, and he said this disturbed him for the rest of his life. But Jack continued on with the rituals and dove even deeper into the occult for answers. He was still so jealous over Sarah's new relationship that he even began sending letters to Alistair as a cry for help. But the answer was always the same, more sex magic. In December of 1945, Jack was inspired by John D to perform Enochian magic, and he called his magical operation the Babylon Working. Supposedly to start this operation up, he and his friend Sergei masturbated onto magical tablets. One community member said that Jack, quote, jerked off in the name of spiritual advancement. His final goal was to manifest the Thelemite goddess Babylon onto Earth. Alistair warned him that it was dangerous work. He had tried something similar before, but ended up summoning a demon. But Jack was desperate for results. During his sessions, he let Elrond join him as his scribe. Jack believed Elrond had a sensitivity to magical phenomenon. And he also believed that Elrond would be unfazed by his sexual rituals. So during their sessions, Jack would jerk off in the room while Elrond sat in the corner of the room searching the astral plane for signs and visions. Supposedly one time he heard his guardian angel through an electric voice. It told him that Jack had an enemy that was out to destroy him, but the rituals continued. Unfortunately, Jack failed to manifest the goddess during these sessions. So in one last attempt, they went out to the Mojave Desert in late February 1946, and supposedly they both took doses of LSD. And after Jack spanked the monkey one last time, he decided that his ritual was complete. After returning to the parsonage, he noticed a new woman had arrived. Her name was Marjorie Cameron. She was currently an unemployed illustrator in a former Navy reserve. After returning from the desert and seeing Marjorie, Jack immediately thought she was the supernatural manifestation of the goddess Babylon, as masturbating rituals had actually worked after all, and he quickly fell in love with her. From an early age, Marjorie was a rebel. As a woman of the mid-1900s, she did what most women wouldn't dare to do, like pursuing riding and joining the Navy. When she was young, she became sexually active, and in her teen years, she also had a strong artistic drive. She later became a map maker for the Navy, and after World War II, she moved to LA to continue her artwork. And through the art scene, that's how she discovered Parsonage. By that March, Jack began performing sex magic rituals with Marjorie, Supposedly, they had sex for two weeks straight, and he called her his Scarlet Woman, which was a reference to the liberating goddess in Aleister Crowley's books. While Jack had sex with her, Elrond continued to sit in the corner of the room and participate as his scribe. Can't even imagine what that must have looked like. All the while, Marjorie had no idea she was even taking part in magic rituals. She thought they were all just freaks who had some weird kinks. She knew nothing about the religious organization or that they thought Jack had invoked her. The whole community knew, but Marjorie didn't. Others would even come into the room while the sex magic rituals were going on so they could watch. Soon after, Marjorie told Jack that she had actually seen a UFO in the sky above Parsonage, and Jack believed this was a materialization of Babylon. Strange enough, on February 26, 1946, there were hundreds, possibly thousands of sightings of ghost rockets being reported in Scandinavia, and this is believed to be the start of the modern UFO phenomenon. Even though Jack didn't know about these sightings at the time, he saw the Babylon working as a success. But it wasn't just about Jack finding a new partner, it was now about proving his magical powers. The next Babylon working for Jack and Elrond was to magically impregnate a woman through immaculate conception. They were inspired by Crowley's book, Moonchild. Once born, this child would become the Messiah and travel the stars. Some also believe this was more symbolic of mankind eventually traveling through the cosmos. But Jack's ultimate goal for these sessions was to prove they could shatter the boundaries of both space and time. At some point, Marjorie left for a trip to New York. Unknown to Jack, she supposedly had an abortion there. It's unclear if the unborn child was Jack's or not. But according to Jack, Marjorie was still willing to participate in the second Babylon working. This time, Jack and Elrond traded off being scribes over a 12-day ritual. 
During their sessions, they would play classical music and place a recording device in the room to pick up any supernatural phenomena. Both of them would scry the astral planes. The next few days were intense and they tried to focus their energies on the goddess Isis in the book Moonchild, hoping to produce an immaculate conception. With no success, Jack then headed out to the Mojave Desert again. Out there, he believed that an entity caused him to psychographically write a sacred text he called Liber 49. This meant that something supernatural was causing him to write the words. He believed he had written the fourth part of the Book of the Law. By now, Alistair Crowley was getting annoyed with Jack's behavior. He barely focused on the OTO Lodge anymore. Almost all of his magical and spiritual efforts were put into Marjorie. And now Jack was trying to add to his written works. Alistair even told a colleague, quote, I am fairly frantic when I contemplate the idiocy of these louts, and their relationship began to fall apart after that. Jack soon sold the lodge house to developers for $25,000. The one condition was that Marjorie and him could continue to live in the coach house. He also stepped down as leader of the lodge and appointed another member to take over. So now that he was done as acting leader of the OTO, Jack co-founded a company called Allied Enterprises with Elron and Sarah. He put his entire life savings into the project, all $21,000. Elron and Sarah didn't contribute anything. But Elrond said that they should go to Miami and buy three yachts with the money. Then they could all sail to California and sell them for a profit. Jack agreed, but a few of his friends, including Edward, told him it was a bad idea. Behind his back, Elrond also requested permission from the U.S. Navy to sail to China, South America, and Central America. He said it was to collect writing material, but really it was just an excuse to travel the world. In the end, Jack lost all of his money because of the business. And Elrond and Sarah left for Miami with $10,000 from Allied Enterprises. Jack confronted Elrond, but Elrond told him there was nothing weird going on. They both agreed to remain business partners for the time being. But Alistair Crowley could easily see that Jack was being scammed, and he called him a weak fool. Then he convinced Jack of what was really going on. Then Jack placed a temporary injunction and restraining order on them, tracked them down to a harbor near Miami where they tried to take one of the yachts and flee. But they ran into an unexpected storm just off of the coast, and they were forced to return the boat to the harbor. Jack was still unsure when they arrived, but he was convinced he had conjured up the storm by performing a lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. In the end, they dissolved the business in a court settlement. Elrond was required to reimburse Jack. Jack also tried to go after Sarah, but she threatened to report him for statutory rape since she was 17 when they began having sex. After litigation, Jack only got $2,900 back. He had lost all of his money and he could no longer support his ex-wife Helen and her child and his relationship with Elrond was over. Both Sarah and Elrond left the Lima and never looked back. Elrond would later marry Sarah, even though he was still technically married to another woman. Sarah later filed for divorce and charged Elrond with extreme cruelty, causing her great mental anguish and physical suffering. Many believe that Sarah was the mastermind behind scamming Jack out of his money. And then Elrond went on to write his infamous Dianetics and create Scientology. And many years later, in 1969, the Church of Scientology released a press statement on what had happened. They said the U.S. Navy sent Elrond to Parsonage as an undercover agent to intercept and destroy Jack's black magic cult and save Sarah. They also claimed that the sci-fi writer Robert A. Heinlein was a Navy operative who sent in Elrond. But after leaving Pasadena, Jack found work at North American Aviation where he worked on the Navajo missile program and he moved into a house in Manhattan Beach with Marjorie. This is where he brought her up to speed on occultism. It was also around this time that Marjorie began having seizures due to catalepsy. And Jack told her that she could manipulate her seizures to achieve astral projection. By October 19th, 1946, they got married only four days after his divorce from Helen was finalized. His good friend Edward acted as their witness. Over the years, Jack continued his work as a specialist in rocketry, and he still maintained his long distance friendship with Aleister Crowley until his death in December 1947. When the Cold War began, the Red Scare spread across the United States, and by 1947, the FBI stripped Jack of his security clearance. They called him a subversive character and mentioned his sexual perversions. Declassified FBI documents later revealed that their primary concern was Jack's former connection to Marxists at Caltech and his membership of the ACLU. After his security clearance was revoked, he struggled to find any work in U.S. rocketry. Eventually, he had to resort to bootlegging nitroglycerin for money, and he also worked as a car mechanic, a gas station attendant, and a hospital orderly. 
and for two years he worked as a faculty member at the USC Department of Pharmacology. In the meantime, Jack and Marjorie's relationship disintegrated. They eventually separated and she moved to Mexico to join an artist commune. When she returned briefly, she found Jack with another woman and she filed for divorce. With almost nothing left, Jack returned to the two things he loved, writing and magic, and he continued performing rituals. At one point, he claimed he was able to astral project himself to the biblical city of Chorazin. This is what he called his black pilgrimage. At one point, he also believed he embodied the Antichrist, and he believed that within nine years, Babylon would manifest on earth and surpass all other religions. As the years passed, Jack finally had a lucky break. He had found an opportunity to work in rocketry again, but the work required him to migrate to Israel to work on the Israeli rocket program. Just before he could leave, he was accused of espionage and attempted theft of classified company documents from Howard Hughes's aircraft company, where he had been doing some contract work. So I'm not going to try and unpack Howard Hughes right now. I'll just give you the, the quick gist. But Howard Hughes was an extremely successful business magnate in the 1900s, and he's considered one of the richest and most influential people of his time. He was also known for his eccentric behavior and odd lifestyle that got stranger and stranger as his life went on. His life is way too expansive to sum up here, but if you're interested in this guy at all, there's a actually a great Scorsese movie. I don't know if you've seen it, Josh. It's called it, The Aviator. Doesn't that have uh, Leonardo DiCaprio yep, in it? Yep, Leonardo DiCaprio plays Howard Hughes. It's a, a great movie, but... I wanted to add Howard Hughes in there because it's, yeah, like I said at the top of the episode, it's crazy how many people Jack Parsons has come across yeah. in his life and just how many how many things he's got his hands in is quite wild. And influential people too, not yeah. just like randos, like people that really made an impact. Yeah, changed the course of Good history. Good or bad. Yeah. After the accusations, the FBI investigated Jack again and suspected that he was a spy for the Israeli government or supplying the Soviets with classified documents. They found a few of the stolen documents, but Jack claimed he was only using them to apply for a future job. He was later found not guilty in 1951. But in 1952, the FBI reinstated their permanent ban on him working for classified projects, including rocketry. So to make a living, he founded the Parsons Chemical Manufacturing Company based in North Hollywood. His company created pyrotechnics and explosives for the film industry, and he also returned to chemical manufacturing at a different company. Eventually, Marjorie reconnected with him. They picked up where they left off and moved into a coach house on Orange Grove Boulevard. He also converted part of his home into a small laboratory to work on chemical and pyrotechnic projects. He also carved out a little spot to brew absinthe. The couple also used the upstairs to have parties for their beatnik friends, and just like old times, neighbors complained to the police and police officers would end up knocking on their door in the early morning hours. Jack then found a new Thelemite group he called the Witchcraft. It was basically a simplified version of Aleister Crowley's The Lima and Jack's own Babylon prophecies. He charged $10 for a course in his teachings and he converted the upstairs into rental units where he charged rent. In the meantime, he also worked with Marjorie on a collection of poems called Songs for the Witch Woman. Marjorie illustrated it and it was later published in 2014. One of her most famous paintings she did was called Dark Angel, and she portrayed Jack as the angel of death. Together, they dreamed of one day moving to Israel where they could start a family and Jack could continue his rocketry career again. Even though Jack was paranoid that the FBI was constantly spying on him, this didn't stop him from making explosives for the film industry. In June of 1952, he got a rush order for explosives for a film set. When Jack hauled his supplies into the house, one of his tenants who lived on the second floor joked to him, quote, be careful or you'll blow us all up. And unfortunately, this project would be Jack's last order of explosives. Because on June 17, 1952, a loud explosion echoed through the streets of Pasadena. Soon after, a second explosion went off. It was heard from over a mile away. The source of the explosions came from Parsons Coach House. Two neighbors rushed into the coach house and found Jack lying on the floor in his laboratory. His right forearm had been completely blown off and his left arm and both of his legs were mangled. The left side of his face and skull had a large hole in it, but somehow he was still alive, but he couldn't say anything. He was rushed to Huntington Memorial Hospital. Inside the ambulance, paramedics could tell he was trying to say something, but couldn't. He died 37 minutes after the explosions. Supposedly, his last words were, I wasn't done. Jack was only 37 years old. 
Marjorie had been out shopping for a vacation that she and Jack planned for Mexico the next day. She refused to see his dead body. Instead, she sent a friend to confirm that the victim was Jack. When the news got to Jack's mother, Ruth, she was obviously very distraught. She ended up taking a fatal dose of barbiturates. And his father had already passed away a few years earlier in a psychiatric hospital. But the police's investigation into the explosions concluded that Jack had been mixing fulminate of mercury in a coffee can and accidentally dropped it on the floor, causing the initial explosion. The chemicals then spread, causing a chain reaction and a second explosion, which blew the doors off the building. His lifelong friend Edward later said that this was likely since Jack had always had sweaty hands, but some of his former colleagues said that he was always extremely careful. Some even claimed that the explosion must have come from beneath the floor and there was an organized plot to kill Jack. Others pointed out that Jack had poorly stored his chemicals, and officials pointed out that Jack had previously been investigated by police for illegally storing chemicals at the parsonage years before. Detectives also found a syringe filled with morphine at the scene, and some suggested that Jack might have been under the influence at the time of the fatal explosion. In the end, investigators closed the case and claimed it was an accidental death. But was it? So endless conspiracy theories have come out about Jack's death. As you mentioned, many pointed out that Jack had worked with explosive materials for years without issues, and he had always been observed by his colleagues as being very extremely careful and diligent with his work. So it was hard for many people to just accept that this was just a silly mistake. Some even believed that Jack had committed suicide and had been depressed for a while. Others believed that Howard Hughes might have planned an assassination because Jack had stolen the Hughes Aircraft uh, uh, confidential company documents while he was a contractor. And even Marjorie was convinced that Jack had been assassinated. She believed that it was possibly the LAPD that wanted revenge on Jack after he testified all those years ago um, because it was the case with the head of police intelligence in LA, Captain Earl Kenyette, um, planned the car bomb mm. for the whistleblower so she thought it was maybe that or she said he might have been killed by an anti-zionist group who were against his rocketry work or his potential rocketry work for israel um, another friend of his named renate drux said that jack might have died during a spiritual rite that was designed to summon a demonic homunculus which is a miniature fully formed human but after everything, I mean, Jack Parsons' death is just still a mystery. I don't know. What do you think? I think the most logical, reasonable explanation is that he just acts. He, well, I mean, there was a syringe of morphine, morphine which we don't yeah. know if that was planted there potentially. Yeah, or you can always think that. Yeah. If that was, you know, something that Jack was using. My guess is that he was probably on drugs when he was doing Agreed. a That's lot of I, these experiments and stuff over I the think years. That too, yeah. And so, when your consciousness is altered, it's very possible to make a mistake and just yeah. accidentally blow yourself up. I think also his friend Edward saying like, yeah, "It's sweaty hands. We just gotta accept." Yeah, like even yeah. he didn't want to say like he was an abuser of drugs. He was just like, "Look, I think we kind of just have to accept that he screwed up and." accidentally killed himself here which i think that take is reasonable it's not the most romantic take but it sounds like he was probably not at the high point of his life he was probably having a rough go of it and he was just like um, abusing drugs maybe and i don't know he's he's at a homemade lab here too yeah so. sure it's not uh exactly up to code you know yeah, what i mean like exactly snuff for what a lab like this should be and and again i think he's a he's kind of a troubled soul yeah. throughout his whole life i mean he's 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 never really able to do and accomplish what he wants to do right especially with the rocketry stuff and his personal life kind of takes him all over the place and you know he's involved with all these different people with very very interesting backgrounds and obviously his personal relationships with women and men are you know take a toll on him over the years so i think he's just i mean i think it's also possible that maybe he just blew himself up maybe he was just like he he kind of saw the writing on the wall and he's like i'm never gonna gonna actually work on the things that i love anymore so what's the what's the point yeah and like not reaching his goals and rocketry and stuff and yeah um 
I also think not reaching his goals in the spiritual realm either, because I think he was kind of grasping at straws. Like he thought Marjorie was this manifestation yeah. of this goddess that he did. And then the Babylon working too, he was trying to, I, I think he maybe just had extremely high expectations for himself and he just wasn't going to reach those. He wanted to impregnate someone through immaculate conception. I think when you set goals that high for yourself, you're just going to probably be dissatisfied. And you truly believe in it, which I think he did. Yeah. I think he really believed in magic and magic and the, the teachings of Aleister Crowley. And I think he really, he really thought that's what was going to get him to his ultimate goal. Yeah. And when that failed so many times and just things don't ever seem to, to go up for him, it's always like something happens and he's got to, He's got to like solve that problem. He's like, he's constantly solving these problems in his life that he's, he's ultimately getting farther and farther away from his, his dream. And I could see, and based on his family history and stuff, and his dad has psychiatric issues, clinical depression. It's very, very clear that he's likely was suffering from, from mental health issues. Yeah. And, and we know he was abusing quite a lot of drugs yeah, too. Yeah. I know? mean, and serious, serious psychedelics and things that alter your, alter your mind state. Yeah. so it, it wouldn't surprise me although i do i do see there is a lot of validity to some of the other theories it would make sense to me that somebody would want him dead as well true yeah um but i feel like if that were the case he likely would have died a different way perhaps but i guess it would make i mean it'd be easy to cover it up like explosions you know yeah, kind of plant factory. something in his laboratory when yeah. he's not home and have it blow up on him yeah He's gonna be like, oh yeah, he just blew himself up. So maybe, maybe that would be kind of the perfect situation. Yeah, it's kind of worth a thought at least. You know, it's not it's not clear cut here. Obviously, no, you could go a lot of different ways with this one for sure. But after his death became public, the secretary treasurer of Aerojet said that Parsons quote liked to wander, but he was one of the top men in the field. Former and current members of the OTO also held a memorial service where his sister's ex-wife Helen and ex-girlfriend Sarah also attended. His obituary stated that he had turned down several honorary degrees from universities, and despite all of his studies, he actually never got an academic degree, which is crazy. Yeah, it's not wild. And I wonder why he turned down the, the honorary degrees. Probably because he was like, that's worth nothing to me. I didn't actually earn it, you know what I mean? I think he was very much like, he wanted to really earn people's respect yeah, and wanted to be known for something that had value to it. And so I think he's like an honorary degree. It's like, it's like a trophy. It's silly. That doesn't mean anything. Yeah. 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 There's no actual, I didn't actually learn anything yeah. or, or obtain the degree the right way. But a private prayer service was held for Jack at a funeral home where his body was cremated. Marjorie then scattered his ashes in the Mojave desert and burned most of his possessions. It's believed that she tried to perform astral projection to speak with him one more time. Today, Jack is remembered as a frontrunner for rocketry and the occult, and his work went on to inspire NASA and even the Apollo missions. Every time an American rocket launches, many believe it's only been possible through Jack Parsons magic manifested into physical energy. In the years since his death, he's been credited as a major contributor to the US rocket project. The International Astronomical Union named a crater on the far side of the moon, so the dark side, after Jack Parsons in 1972. Many of his writings were posthumously published as Freedom is a Two-Edged Sword in 1989. Biographies have also been written in decades since his death, including Strange Angel in 2005 and Sex and Rockets, The Occult World of Jack Parsons in 1999. So some good books if you want to know some more information about him. And that's basically all the information that I picked up are essentially from those two books. Okay. So yeah, that is the uh, absolutely insane life of Jack Parsons. Just there's so much to, to wrap your head around. I mean, I'm sure there's so much more too that yeah. can even fit into this already long episode. Here's my one gripe. It's kind of a big one. Yeah. He seemed like him and a lot of the people he dealt with were like almost to the point of cringe a bit elitists like his ad in the newspaper to get people to come to the parsonage it's like you know atheists bohemians whatever etc 
and then all mundane people will be rejected. Like as in, that's such like a snobbish thing to say. And I get what they're looking for. They do just want the creative types, people who are willing to think outside the box, but they don't say it that way. And it kind of rubs me the wrong way a little bit. It's like you mundane, you know, peasants. Yeah. Stay out yeah. there. If you want to come into our mansion and do some cool stuff, you can do that. But it's kind of a secret society and it's only for people who are interesting. And that that rubbed me the, a little bit the wrong way. Yeah. It's not like he's known as Jack Parsons, you know, leader yeah. of, of the people. You yeah. Know what I mean? He's not, yeah. he's definitely, I mean, look at where he came from. He came from privilege and, and wealth. I mean, he really never knew what it was like to be a, you know, an average person. I mean, he definitely worked some more blue collar jobs and I think he got tastes of it throughout his life, but I don't think he really ever knew what it was like to just be a part of normal society. Yeah. Um, Like everything had this like elitist approach to it or, you know, he ran in circles with a lot of very, famous and influential people that also had had a lot of things to say about him and kind of inflated his ego i definitely think he was uh, egotistical for sure like he's an egotistical individual who really thought he was special and had special powers and special connections to to you know this other other realm the supernatural and and you know same same with alistair crowley and all these you know other people too like it's the same they're all in the same headspace, yeah, right? Look at L. Ron Hubbard and what he went on to do. I yeah. mean, it's it, that tells you a lot. Yeah. And L. Ron Hubbard was kind of watching Jack Parsons. You know yeah, what I mean? right. Like, yeah. He was in the room while they're doing their thing. Yeah. And so uh, that's really interesting because even when you dive into to L. Ron Hubbard, it, I feel like Jack Parsons doesn't really come up too much in no, his, yeah, his background. I know the, I think it was Going Clear, the HBO documentary series that was ref- kind of based on the book of the same name they do mention jack parsons but it's so in they glaze over him but really they they, it seems like they had a pretty in-depth relationship with one another yeah it seems like it it really sparked something in elrond as and for good or bad but and of course elrond is a scammer from like day one (laughs) elrond like sees jack parsons he's like oh i'm gonna get this guy i know and he totally does he's like let's get some yachts and travel the world spend all your money so i can steal your girlfriend and then go sail across the world it's wild i believe the yachts that they ended up buying ended up being the sea org boats like he turned those into the sea org is that it yeah yeah i was looking into that i was like yeah i guess the boats they ended up buying were like the original uh sea org yachts well there we go yeah so i mean very very interesting story for sure and life that jack parsons lived as short as it was only 37 years yeah that's that's kind of sad that i wonder what he would go on to do i mean the it makes me think of uh, oppenheimer too did you see oppenheimer no i haven't seen it yet well the he kind of had a little bit of the same thing where accused of of you know communist ties and uh, even though he would technically wasn't a part of the communist party and kind of started to ruin his career. Um, but same thing with Jack Parsons. And that's why what confuses me is that he's kind of so elitist and he has this huge ego, but he does have this part of him that's down with the working man. He yeah. kind of has these communist ideals. So maybe he was torn about that too. And then I, I don't know the irony that he eventually, by the end of his life, he, he was just a, kind of just a common working man working out of a coach house in his homemade lab and he almost couldn't deal with the fact that he was just an average joe so yeah. to speak but i wonder even how smart he was like yeah he never finished school he never got his academic degree i'm like even if they did hire him i mean he definitely worked on stuff but i'm like how much did he actually know because for i would imagine for aerospace engineering and rocketry you need extensive mathematical skills you need extensive physics and and all of that like was he just inherently a genius and he just like knew this stuff and and kind of picked it up as he went along or i feel like a lot of his his stuff was like trial by fire he's like experimenting yeah. he's like well let's see if we can find this chemical this chemical yeah. what happens just blowing stuff blows up, up. you yeah. know what i mean it seems like a lot of it's not very 
method it doesn't seem very scientific to me yeah and he's just kind of like combining like he knows enough to be dangerous but he doesn't know enough to get a rocket to the moon you know yeah I, mean? I also think he was good at rubbing elbows with the right people obviously because you know even when he wasn't in college he was still in that academia he was making connections with people so i think that helped him a lot too of just being this charming guy who knew how to make connections with people and yeah and that kind of got him to where he i mean he was he was kind of top dog in a lot of places but maybe at the end of it it wasn't just a problem with his occultist ties that a lot of people like to draw on it was maybe that maybe he wasn't as good as he thought he was right you know yeah because i mean there was other companies working on this kind of stuff at the time yeah that could have picked him up probably but but i i do think a lot of it does stem back to it his occultist ties and ties to Aleister Crowley because I mean that was very like you know compared to like the majority of of the country at the time and you know a lot of the country's Protestant and you know they are they're looking at that as all evil demonic and 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 you know maybe it is and so they were like yeah we don't want anybody that's you know making explosives in their free time and having sex with <laughs> all these random people and doing you know conjuring demons and whatnot yeah, um, to be a part of our company it would be like a bad to it. like it'd be a bad i mean he made it kind of a bad name for himself out there in the world yeah, it's bad pr yeah but he was i don't know i i also feel like he was more of a dreamer and more of a yeah more of a writer's soul than he is an engineer yeah you know? he seems too creative and fun to be an engineer nothing against engineers we need you guys out there yeah. in the world my dad was an engineer too so like engineers they just have different mindsets on things and he he doesn't come across as an engineer no. or like a scientist he doesn't really come across that way no no not really what about you daniel you got any thoughts on mr parsons well i think in defense of mr parsons to exceed and be the best in the world at something or to you know be better than everybody else at something you have to be a little weird yeah, there's nobody who's at the you know the top of their game in any field. That's just normal. You have to live an unbalanced life to succeed in something. I personally, that's so true. And then also in the K in the defense of L. Ron Hubbard, I would probably also want to scam the guy that made me scribe while he was jerking <laughs> off. Like two years. I'd probably want to get back at him too. So in defense of L. Ron Hubbard, I'd, I'd probably do that too. I haven't heard those words in a while in defense of L. Ron Hubbard. Oh, man. Such a wild story, though. We definitely want to know your thoughts on, on this one. I'm sure you'll have plenty of them. I mean, there's so many things to, to digest with this story, but we're going to go ahead and leave it there for today. We'll see you guys next time. And until then, lights out, everybody.